I'm not your typical guy. Well, be quiet. I need to pull something up here. Everybody take out your devices and open your Bibles. Uh, Come on, turn around. There we go. I'm trying to find a little text I got from a sweet uh, member of the church. And she says, I sure do think highly of you, exclamation. Thanks for being a great pastor, a little pink heart. And I said, oh my, thanks so much. And I call her name. That really encourages me. Tell you a word of love and encouragement. Boy, does it mean a lot. And you never know when it comes just at the right time. And Pastor Jeff and Pastor Zach, they're off. Uh, Showing Brianna the Minneapolis area. She's going to go to school there. And so they're gone. A lot of other people gone to spring break. And uh, we, if you're watching, we welcome you. And thank you for being here. You take your turn to First Corinthians chapter one if you got your Bibles. <clears throat> if you didn't, yeah, I know. If you didn't get uh, a magazine, at least your, raise your hand. You didn't get one of these by the doors on as you exit. This is a quarterly magazine. It's got news, but it's also got information uh, of announcements and different things in there. So be sure you keep that. It's a, for the spring quarter, and uh, Joel does such a nice job putting that together for us. Also. Uh, we're going to do a dollar blessing. I don't remember the name because I'm forgetful, but Pastor Brian knows there's a family because of medical issues that's got this mound of, of, of a struggle financially. And if we could just do a dollar blessing, uh, and I did that in the early, I gave away my last money um, there to that. But uh, if you want to, if you're visiting, we do this every once in a while. We'll just pass a dollar down. If you don't have it, no worries. We're just going to bless a family, and I'm, I'm going to just keep their name uh, anonymous, but it is, a, it is a part of our church. So, All right, so let me ask you a question. How many of you think the most important thing in a church is um, is um, oh, there it is, okay, is prayer? Raise your hand. How many think the most important thing in church is prayer? Raise your hand. How many think the most important thing in church is worship? Raise your hand. How many think the most important thing in the church is teaching? Raise your hand. Knowing the word, okay? I'm tricking all of you, okay? All of those things are, are most important. And several other things. Fellowship, building each other up. God gave, gives us all these things as a fellowship, as a church body that we need to do so that the most important thing can be effective and done well. For Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, to give my life a ransom. He came knowing he was going to die. The God incarnate, Jesus Christ, the living God. He came because he saw the depravity of man into a dark, time, a dark, sick, deeply sinful world, Jesus came to die while we were yet sinners, according to Romans 5.8, to die for each, for you and for me. And before he left, he said in multiple places, he said, go into this world and preach the good news. The gospel means the good news and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all things I've commanded to you. In other words, a heart for the lost, winning the lost is the heart of God. And we have, as one of our hallmarks when we started this church, it was missions, missions around the world. And I remember back in uh, October of 1999, about February of 1999, the church was uh, a little a little over about eight and a half years old, a little over eight years old. We'd started in October 7, 1990. And we had built the building over here where is now the Student Campus Auditorium building. And we owed quite a bit of money on it. And I was hoping that on our anniversary of our 10th year of existence, which would have been October of 2000, we could pay off that mortgage. And I had calculated watching what was happening 
And I calculated in my head that we would need around a $100,000 cash offering to pay that mortgage off. So I'd mentioned this a couple of times about saving back money. In the meantime, I was frustrated because I believed in missions and I believe in three things about missions. And, and I, I believe that everybody should pray for missions. Everybody should give the missions, even if it's a nickel a week. You should give something as to say the heart of God. God, I believe in missions and I'm giving something. And everybody should, should be a witness, be a missionary to share the gospel themselves and not just think if I give money and pray for missionaries, they'll take care of it. I don't have to do anything. And so at that point, uh, the church had given, and I looked at it, not more than just a little over $40,000 for the whole year is the most we'd ever given to missions. And I was very frustrated because I knew with our congregation that there is no way we should be doing better. And I, and I wasn't very good at, 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 at this and at getting people inspired or understanding and the heart of missions. And we went over eight years when we started the church, but every Sunday there was a first-time conversion every week somebody was coming to Christ that did not know Christ before. That's besides the people that came back and dedicated their heart to the Lord. So we had a number of people that were, were new to God and following God, and, and, but just not much in missions. And Sam Johnson invited me to go to Ethiopia, and that's the video you saw of Dr. Lowenberg, Doug Lowenberg, thanking us for that Bible college that we helped build, right? And so when I came back, First, I thought, we can do this, and it was small. Then I thought, God said, mm, we can do better. I thought, we'll do this. And This was over a two-year period. Sam, the missionary, said, do something. See what your church could do for the next two years. And my heart was so gripped with the revival happening in Ethiopia and the need in Ethiopia, both physically. I gave every nickel I had away to those poor people before I came back. My heart was so gripped by it. But I saw that the answer wasn't just a temporary monetary fix, but it was more than that. And it was a gospel, and there was a mighty revival moving across, and still is, in Ethiopia and other nations that have less because all they have is God, and they hang on to it. And so I, I felt, and so I got this number. I thought, we're going to try to do $50,000 in the next two years, and God just kind of put in my spirit, no, you're going to do it in one offering, $50,000. i am going, we've never given more than $40,000. What am I going to tell to our deacon board? So I ended up telling them, what I, what I felt like the Lord wanted me to, wanted us to do, and they said, okay, and they looked at me a little cross-eyed, just to be honest, because we had only given a little over 40 for a whole year combined, and I understood that, but thank, thank the Lord for guys that were, you know, full of faith and allowed that step, and I'm going, I don't know what's going to happen, so we announced in June that uh, we're going to give everything we're saving to pay off that building, we're going to give and give generously the our anniversary Sunday of our ninth year, October of 99, and that offering, and I have this styrofoam check that Sam Johnson made. It's about this big and about that tall, that, that big, in my garage up on my wall, 65,700 and something dollars came in in cash for that Bible college that time. And from that point on, I don't know, when I announced it, all of a sudden the offering started going up, people started flooding in, and from that point on, the building got paid for quicker and quicker. And guess what? We never had to take an offering for our building. By June of 2000, before the 10-year anniversary, the building was paid for. And let me tell you, God has a heart for missions. And when you give, when you give to the Lord, you're not giving to me. It doesn't affect anything with me. And you don't give because a church needs it. God doesn't need anything. He's the captain of the church. He's the Lord of all, the church. And... I believe in tithing, which is obedience and giving of a tenth of all of my income. And I believe in sacrificial giving to missions and benevolence and other things. As it was in the Old Testament, it still is in the New Testament. It's the same because God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what we did here today is very biblical in that we took a benevolence offering because they always would take offerings for the poor besides the tithe and besides sacrificial offerings to take needs of those who went forward like Paul and Barnabas and went on their missionary journeys. So I believe in missions and guys, men, some of you, you don't ever sign up for a breakfast but you show up and I will buy you a ticket, it's $5, you just tell them Pastor Weaver is paying and whoever's back there, you tell me how many 
I will buy you the $5 ticket, but don't just, we'll have, typical at a breakfast, we'll have 40 or 50 sign up and 75 to 80 show up because men aren't very responsible, I've found out, some of them. <laughs> so look, go get a ticket. We have a missionary coming in this Saturday and they're going to be there for a breakfast. It's from 8 to 9.15, okay? 8 o'clock to 9.15 to get challenged, to be inspired by the stories, to see God's heart for the world and the lost all over the world. And the missionaries that we have coming in are coming in from countries where if they were caught, their life could be in danger. They could be martyred for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if they can do that, at least we can come and hear, hear them and pray for them and get to know them. And women, the T's, the same thing. You're a lot better. Commend you. But sign up. Let's have a big crowd. Let's fill that up for Saturday. And listen, I understand that sometimes some of you have to work or they're out of town or whatever, and that's okay. But I believe in missions. I believe in it. But I believe that everything we do, we can't buy out, buy off the responsibility of taking the gospel and speaking the gospel and talking about Jesus to everybody. You can talk about me to everybody and tell them how weird I am, and that doesn't do anybody any good. You can talk about somebody else that doesn't do any good. It's Jesus, and that's the title of my message, Jesus. Simple, Jesus. Can you say Jesus? Jesus. Amen. I love Jesus. I pray that Jesus will touch you this morning. We're turning to 1 Corinthians, and then we're going to turn chapter 1, and then we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then I will refer to a Philippians passage. It won't be on the screen, and you're not going to find it uh, unless you turn quickly in, in the book of Philippians. Paul wrote uh, both of these letters, and we learned we're starting in a series in 1 Corinthians, and, and we learned that the Corinth was a center of that collected people from all over the world. So we had a lot of different languages and cultures, a lot of religions and cultish practices and all that. But many, both Jew and Greek and from all over, have become to, to be Christians. But the church there was very immature. It was a, a, a young church. It was Christians that needed to be taught. And they were involved in a lot of things, having problems. And they were like playing spiritual king of the mountain. Look at me. Look at me. And the last verse in chapter 1 and I'm not going that says, let no one boast unless they boast in the Lord Jesus. Let him glory, let him that glory, not in flesh, but glory in the Lord. Let God get all the glory in, through, in Jesus Christ. So I pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1, verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, I'm reading NASB, I believe NIV is on the screen. I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. Notice the word same mind. You can underline that. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people. That's kind of like, I like that, Chloe's people. You know, you get your people, I get my people, let's get together, right? Let's get the peeps together. That there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul. Well, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. Cephas is another word. It's Peter. The one that walked on the water, it's Peter. The one that chopped the ear off of the soldier, Peter is Cephas here. And, well, I'm of Christ. Verse 13. Has Christ been divided? Paul wasn't crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God, Paul, Paul's writing this, and Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, oh, I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, Paul says, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The word gospel means good news. Here's what the good news is. God looked down and out of his love, he sent his only begotten son. And Jesus Christ came and was born of a virgin. He dwelt among men. He lived sinless. He did no sin. And he became the perfect sacrifice. He taught he taught us and left us a lot of teachings, and he did no sin. He became the perfect sacrifice, and he died on the cross to take my place for my sin, for my punishment of my sin. He died in my place on the cross. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again, and then he ascended on high. 
And he's at the right hand of God the Father, and he's praying for you and I, and he loves you, and he's offering because he doesn't want anybody ever to perish. He wants no, it's not his will that anyone perish. He wants everyone to have eternal life. And so he's praying for you. He's calling you. He's yearning for you. He's saying, come to me. I'll forgive your sin. There's nothing you've done that I can't forgive. The power of my blood that I shed on that cross is powerful enough to wash away every speck of your sin. And he's crying out to you. That is the gospel. And Paul says, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. And let me just tell you, uh, Paul had the ability to be clever. He was a brilliant man. We know that. God saved him and showed him the power of the cross. In chapter 3, uh, this is a cousin uh, uh, passage to chapter 1, verses 10 to 17 I just read. And here's chapter 3, starting in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ, or babies. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were yet able to receive it. You weren't ready to receive it, the meat. You had to have milk. Indeed, even now you're not ready. You're not able. For you are still fleshy. Ask yourself, am I fleshy? Am I a fleshy believer? You're still fleshy. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshy? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, here he is bringing it back up. Must have been a big problem. For one says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos. Are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. And Paul says, I laid a foundation. And what was the foundation? Jesus Christ. Solid rock. The foundation is Jesus. And everything that we stand on, everything that is happening, everything around us is about Jesus. And we're to focus on him, keep our eyes on him, follow him, live for him, and make it about him. It's not about us. Okay, so the, 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 first, the first thing I want you to see is that it's Jesus, not, it's, not, it's about Jesus, not me, or not you. Not me, and it's not you. Paul always expressed great concern about the possibility of having a split in the church. And you might be reminded of his words in verse 10 of a similar passage in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Holy Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, he's talking to the church, the Philippian church, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind, and of one mind, Philippians 2, 1 and 2, one mind, one mind, of the same mind. He says it to the Corinthians too. Remember when I said underline the same mind. And I, he says, I appeal to you. And back in Corinthians, in chapter one, he says, I appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is appealing to is that we would be one at, under Jesus. And the relationship to Christ is the unifying factor of the church. There's no other name big enough, great enough, glorious enough, powerful enough to gather everybody together despite the diversity of viewpoint and differences of background or status in life. We share, it's, it's, it's the, the only thing that can do it is the name of Jesus. And that's why the apostle Paul 
He appeals to the name of Jesus, to look at Jesus, to be one and to keep it about Jesus. And he recognizes that we share a common life if we have come to Jesus Christ. That we're brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ because his life is in us. And he is the ground, the foundation always of unity, of what we stand on, and of truth. And more than that, we have a responsibility to obey him and also to follow his lordship. Therefore, the only basis upon which you can get Christians to agree together and be one, one, is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and calling them back to the fundamental base. That is what Paul does. He calls us back to Jesus Christ and to his cross. For if you haven't noticed, the ground at the foot of the cross is level because I need him and you need him. We all need him. We need Jesus, folks. You need him every day, every hour. You need him. You know, America, the church and outside the church, and outside the church in particular and in a lot of other churches that, that um, seem to have taken torn pages out of the Bible to say that don't, no longer applies. There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of depravity. There's a lot of darkness and blindness. There's a lot of, it seems like to me, well, I don't agree with that. The Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways and that there is a way that seems right to man, but the end leads to destruction. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to simply say a prayer, sing a prayer, it's change my heart, oh God. Because you see, when God changes your heart, he changes your eyes to see things the way he sees it. He changes your heart to feel about the lost, about the world, about your neighbor, about your fellow church attender, to feel the way he feels, that, pack, that pity and compassion and kindness, and to think about things the way he thinks. So no longer, because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we've got to align our thinking with the word of God. Our, our, our hearts have to be changed. And if you haven't heard me say this, I want you to listen. If you miss everything else, hear this. Your heart isn't just feeling, it's thinking. Your heart is your thinking and your feeling. It's together. God has to change your thoughts and change your way you feel about that. Because, again, the proverb writer, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's not the organ that pumps blood. And in the old... The, 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 even in the Old Testament, this concept of loving God with all your heart really has to do with your innards. It's, we, we, we clean it up in the Bible with the, the, the organ of the heart, to kind of understand, but it's, you know, it's the, all the innards with, within you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me, with everything within me. Bless his holy name. So, with that, I, I just say that, that we need a heart change. The only way the world is going to get Jesus is if we really get a hold of a heart change and quit having church because having church is always going to be about me and you. And it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And until God changes our heart and we see Jesus and think his thoughts and feel as he feels and, 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 and then, it's, then we're never going to get what he's asked us to do done. See, Jesus said he comes to seek and save the lost. He comes to serve and not be served. That his meat is to do the will of the Father, and that's to take this good news to every person. And you can't give your responsibility by giving money to a missionary away. You are called a missionary, a sent one. You and I are each sent. Go into all the world. And in Acts, Luke records, which he was the doctor and he was a detailed, he says the Holy Spirit will baptize you and fill you that you might be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is our hometown, in Judea, which is the, the state, and, 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 and uh, Judea, Samaria, uh, and, uh, and that's the country, and the uttermost part of the world, that's all of the countries. Are you with me? Everywhere. And we're a part of it by praying, giving, to send people all over, and to go and be a witness. So let me ask you a question. Is your heart changed? Do you see people as either lost or unlost? Do you cry? How long has it been since you shed a tear over someone that you love that's not going to make it to heaven?
They're going to they're gonna miss out on eternity with God. God gave everything. He loved the world so much. He gave everything so that, so that, we, could, so that we could be free from sin. And listen, there was a word that the Holy Spirit gave me that I'm going to mention to you now. That God didn't just give his son to erase sin so you could go on sinning and give grace the definition of grace. Listen, he gave Jesus because he wants to free you from sin. And over and over, when Jesus would heal someone and forgive their sin, he would tell them, go and sin no more. The word of God and the spirit of God is strong enough. You don't have to be captive to the bondage or the stronghold of the enemy that catches you where you're sinning a repentance to the sin you have this secret guilt and condemnation if you will spend as much compassion and time with god's word and talking to god and listening to god he will fill you up you see it was a trick question is prayer important yes because prayer and the word of god and fellowship uh, and worship all those things strengthen you to give you the essence from the inside out to be what god wants you to be so we can go do what god called us to do what is the vision statement of our church? Heaven, one word, vision statement, heaven. What's our mission? To go there and take as many people with us. Let's keep it simple. Uh, I had a friend of mine who loved to be cruel to me, and I would sometimes not keep it so simple, not to get confusing, and I wasn't a very good speaker, you know? And he would say, kiss it. I'd say, what? he said, keep it simple, stupid. I said, okay, I received that in the love of God. I receive it. But we have, a, we have a job to do. You see, the church, it's not about you and I. And secondly, the second point is that it's not about my, my, it's not about theology or my preference. It's not about your preference or my preference. If the church is about my preference only, then I would be selfish and there'd be a lot of people that wouldn't have access to connect with God in a special way. I mean, young people, listen to me. Look, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. But if I picked the songs every Sunday, you wouldn't love me. <laughs> and if you picked the songs every Sunday, I would tolerate you. <laughs> Just saying. It's not in our preference. You know, it doesn't, you know, I prefer this, I prefer that. That's, that looks pretty. I, should we have flowers or not have flowers? Should we have plants or not plants? Should we have light shining in everybody's faces? No, I don't know. God's not against light. He's the light of the world. I don't know. Should we do this or that? Should we have a stained glass window or not a stained glass window? I don't know. Does it matter? Is that really what it's about? Is it, or is it about Jesus? Is it about your preference or my preference? No. Right? So prefer one another in love. That's preference, what Jesus says. Because we, that's what Jesus does. He laid his life down for us. He didn't come to be served, but to serve, to give himself a ransom. The church is never called to have everybody think exactly alike. The, Paul, the apostle says that we're to be the same mind. Back to that phrase in Philippians and in Corinthians, the same mind. So how could that be? Well, in Philippians 2, verse uh, 5, it says this, uh, let this mind be which, in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. He goes on to describe the mind of Christ. What, what does that look like? And it's willingness to give up our rights and pick up responsibility. Instead of being focused, I want this, I want that, this is my right, this is what I get. No, it's what I give. It's what is my responsibility. And then the whole passage about Jesus comes in and it picks up there. He says, to let the mind be in you which was in Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, didn't count it equality of God to be a thing he grasped, but he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant. He became a human being, born in the likeness of men, and became found in fashion in the human form. He, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even the death of the cross. Why? Because he wanted people to have their sins forgiven and be saved and go to heaven. And that's the heart of God. That's why he has to change our heart. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart. And would you pray that at the close of this service in just a moment and mean it when you pray it in song. This is the mind Paul is talking about. When everybody decides to put things of Christ first and is willing to suffer loss for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ and his gospel may be advanced. That's what brings harmony and unity in a congregation. We have one mind and one purpose and we're going to focus on that and not our little petty differences. You know, 
theology doesn't have to be perfect. I don't, I don't even want you to agree with me on all of these theologies. You're checking your brain at the door if you do. I don't, I'm probably wrong about some stuff. It says stay, Paul even teaches that. Don't be arguing little stuff like that. Stay with the gospel, which is what I went over a while ago, all about Jesus, uh, you know, being sent from heaven, born of a virgin, sinless life, all that. That's what we agree on. Sure, theology, it's not that it's not important, but it's not something to war over or fight over or argue over or to divide us. We can discuss it. It's a good thing. Talk about it. It's a good thing. And then walk away disagreeing if you want, but don't have anything against your brother. Love him anyway, right? Georgine, she's 196 or something like that. <laughs> Georgine, what's wrong with you? You okay? All right, she's okay. She'll say to me every now and then in the sweetest way, well, I just, I don't, I just don't understand that. But, but, oh, well, it doesn't really matter anyway after all in the big picture, is it? It sounds like Solomon said something like that when he talked about all is vanity, life is vanity, and then he ends with fear God, serve God, because someday we're going to face God. Right? Keep it simple. What are we going to do with Jesus? He's the one that provided you eternal life. What are you doing with Jesus? And what are you doing for the world with Jesus? So here's the thing. The church doesn't belong to you and it doesn't belong to me. God put it there for us to build us up and Christ be in us and we're his body. But it's what Paul uses as the basis for the unity of the church is this attitude of selflessness, this mind of Christ, this responsibility to the leadership of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he, he, he describes going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, he describes the forms that are dividing the church at Corinth. And he says, what I mean is that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas. Another says, Cephas is another name for Peter, right? The one, right? He's the one that chopped off the ear of the soldier and walked on water and a little loud mouth. Or I belong to Christ, or I belong to Christ. See, there was a trouble in Corinth. They hadn't divided yet, but there were little factions or cliques within the church, four of them. And we just seen, saw them listed there. And there were the, first of all, the loyalists and said, well, Paul, I'm of Paul. He's the one we're going to listen to above all others. And this was a large group. And uh, uh, so undoubtedly, uh, they were following Paul and good reason, I suppose. Then there were the stylists. Those were, oh, by the way, Pastor Jeff is like the Paul. All right. Paul breaks it down. He's detailed, uh, perfectionist. He lays it out in lots of detail and lots of words so that you get the full measure the teacher Paul, that's Pastor Jeff, right? Right? And that can, you sometimes, you know, that's, you got to kind of read that and like really think and it makes you think deep. I love to hear Pastor Jeff preach. I love to hear him speak. He's awesome. I'm Follow Jeff. Uh, <laughs> then there were the stylists, those who were attracted by different kinds of preaching. And they had especially been drawn to Apollos. See, the book of Acts tells us that Apollos was an outstanding orator. He had a silver tongue. And that that world, the Corinth, they loved and appreciated that oratory. He was a, quite the speaker, is especially capable in using an allegorical style and uh, of teaching, uh, and of course, at that time, the Old Testament. And uh, they were saying, man, I love to hear old Paulus speak. He's a great preacher, man, warm, capable, an eloquent man with words. And who, can, who, who, who really makes that Old Testament come alive? Now, I'm wondering who that is at New Hope. Silver tongue, slick, perfect words, well spoken. Apollos Don. Apollos Hawkins. I don't know who I am. We got Paul the Jeff and Don the Apollos. Then there were the traditionists. They're always there. They say, Well, I don't know about that old Paul and Apollos. So let's get back to the beginning. Let's go back to when New Hope first started here. We're of Peter. Peter evidently had been through Corinth and he preached there. So they said when Peter came, we really felt that we were on solid ground. After all, he was one of the first apostles that Jesus himself appointed and called. So they were splitting and, and arguing and quarreling over the relative merit and authority of those various teachers. I can be a little bit of loud mouth, chop off your ear and say something ugly and then feel bad like Peter. Right? No. 
Some of you being awful mean, your head's about to bobble off. <laughs> and then there was that fourth group, and somehow they, these were almost the worst of all. They were saying, well, you may be a Paul, and you may be a Paulus, and you may be a Peter, but I'm of Christ. It's almost like these guys, I don't need to hear from them. Well, I guess in the Bible says he gives us pastors and he gives us teachers. And when you become an island, you're sitting over here by yourself and going, I don't want to follow any of them. You know, there needs to be order and there needs to be responsible leadership that's a servant leadership that we cooperate with. And I'll get people who they won't listen to me or anybody else, but they're going to listen to some evangelist that I know good and well his theology stinks and they come up with all kinds of stuff from claiming Cadillacs to whatever you want to believe or even go on the, you want to go, you can find it anywhere, radio TV. You can go find the guy that says in 1936 the rapture already done happened. We're all here living in, we're living in the great tribulation right now. Well, it ain't too bad right now. I don't think it's the great tribulation. You don't want to miss when Jesus comes. I'm telling you that right now. Are you with me? So, you know, that spiritual arrogance and spiritual pride that I don't, I don't have to cooperate or follow anybody. I'm following Jesus. Look at me. I'm the, I'm the top. And this is going on like this is horrible stuff. And in chapter 3, he comes back to this thing of following people, and we read it. He's going, you know, one, one seed plants a seed, one till, one's water. Another one comes along, and the harvest goes forth. Who are you? You don't get a notch in your belt like I won 10 people. Pink, 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 you know. Give me a little star for being in Sunday school 52 weeks out of the year. It's good to go to Sunday school, but guess what? It doesn't give you any glory, any credit. Could you guys ask me, can I just ask you a favor? Never, ele never do anything but el but but uh, appreciate man, don't elevate them. Don't elevate anybody. We all need Jesus. Appreciate that, 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 that encouragement from, him, from the lady that gave me that. She, she was encouraging me and appreciating me, but she wasn't elevating me. And that's a mistake, and people fall under that. Don't ever do that. We're not about me, or it's like Jeff said last week, or any of us. This church has got to be about Jesus and the cross of which he died and his blood that washes away our sin, the sacrifice he took for our sin. I would have had to die if Jesus hadn't died in my place. So it's about Jesus and none other, and that's the unity that we share. It's the unity we share. Uh, so uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 17 again, I'll just read that verse one more time. Christ didn't send me to baptize, Paul says, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so the cross of Christ would not be made void. And so, void. So it brings up the cross, and that always heals it. That always heals us because we all know that we all need the cross. We all need the blood, and it wipes away the petty distinctions that men make among themselves. The cross strips away our illusions and brings the pride of men tumbling down from the high place place which exalts itself against the knowledge of God and Paul is going to go on to describe the radical force that's so different than anything else nothing like it in the world and no other man would have ever thought of doing this to save humanity except God himself who came up with the cross that his son would die on if it had been left up to us the plan of God the program by which God would change the world we would have never had a cross involved in the blood of Jesus that's a radical principle that we need to understand because when you understand the cross there'll be no more room left for divisions of men that's why Paul calls us back to Jesus and the cross on which he died and there we have to agree and love and let me tell you something when God's love when you see it after God you know some of you if you even a fifth of the time thought about Jesus and read the word as much as you watched the basketball and bracketology you'd be a whole lot more full of God just ask yourself, what is my life? What is my purpose? What is my mission? Am I just enjoying the good life? Am I just enjoying getting away? Am I just enjoying this? Or am I after Jesus Christ? And I'm going to tell you what, if you're having some trouble where your heart isn't being drawn to the right place, you're not thinking the way God thinks, you don't feel about the lost the way he does, you go, there's something wrong. I don't have a heart for missions. I don't have a heart for the lost. I don't have a desire to win the lost. Then the only answer is God. I can't preach you under enough conviction. It's God, you have to say, God, change my heart to be your heart. And I'll guarantee you that's his heart. He came to seek and save the lost. He willingly laid his life down. The Bible says no man could take his life from him. He said when it was time, he laid it down and he died for us and suffered when he died. And we're called to the foot of the cross. The last thought that we have, not only is it not, it's about Jesus and not about me or you. It's not about theology or preferences 
It's not about our will, but God's will. For he said, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The the inference is not mine, not yours, but God's will. Do you want God's will in your heart? If you're not sure, or if you go, I do, but I struggle like living it out in church, I go, yeah, yeah. But then when I get out there, I have, listen, ask God to change your heart. The musicians come, you're here today, and you say, you know what? I don't know if I believed in Jesus, but I'm not sure that Jesus is coming into my heart. See, coming into your heart is coming into your thinking and your feeling, your emotion, your life as a whole, your innermost being, and changing your heart. The songwriter says, change my heart, O God. Listen to me. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. You can't change your own heart. You got to cry out to Jesus. I remember when I asked Jesus, I sang into my heart. Come into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I didn't understand anything but that. I didn't understand, but the Holy Spirit came upon me in His power and grace. Something did something in me and changed the way I thought, changed the way I felt, changed the way I believed about myself, changed the way I saw the world. He changed everything because Jesus showed up when I cried out, come and change my heart. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, would you say, I need Jesus to change my heart, either about the lost or about my heart that is selfish and sinful. I'm not sure I'm going to meet God someday, and I want to be right with God. I want heaven. And if you're first saying, I just need to get things right, whether you've ever come to him or not, I want God to make my heart right and pure and true with every eye closed and every head bowed to respect your neighbor. And I'm going to look around till it happens. Close your eyes, or I'm going to call you out. Please respect your neighbor. Okay? It's a respect thing. Okay? And you're here, you say, Jesus, I want you to change my heart and forgive my sin and help me desire you and desire truth and righteousness and holiness. Raise your hand and say, I want you to change my heart. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. About 35 hands went up all around here. And some of you aren't raising your hand, but you know it's you too. You know it's you. And you're sitting here and you're going, God, what's wrong? Why do I keep feeling this caught, this stronghold? Why do I, what's going on? Ask God to change your heart, to come in and break the chains that bind you to come in Jesus has the power you you call on him he's the one that breaks the chains he's the one that sets the captives free he's the one that will deliver you he's the one that will set you free and you can go and sin no more and you're here and you need that and some of you say change my heart toward the lost and my heart that I would pursue most of my time is more about you about your word reading your word praying hungering seeing the lost they change my heart in the area of evangelism and missions, getting this Jesus to everybody. Raise your hand. You say, I need a heart change. I need a passion. I need a new fervency for the, for the world and for the lost. I appreciate your honesty. Would you stand and sing this? Everybody has a prayer. Change my heart, oh God. Would you sing it out?